Thank you, Noreen. Um, thank you, Anka, for leading off the conference on the topic of Proust's women. Um, we have an exciting group of scholars following and are grateful for all of them for coming. Um, Caroline Weber, Holly Harder, Benjamin Taylor, and Harold Argenbroom. Mm -hmm. I'd also like to thank a few other important people. First, of course, Noreen and the staff at the Center for Fiction for administering the Shattuck Prize for four years now, providing a home for Roger's collection and coordinating the second Proust Conference. We deeply appreciate your commitment to these activities and for providing a place to expose the reading public as well as contemporary writers to Proust. Secondly, I'd like to thank Stan Burnett, a longtime member of the Proust Society of America here at the Center for Fiction, who took on the task of planning the details of the Proust Conference. He was instrumental in planning the first Proust Conference in 2010. He is passionate about Proust and about today's festivities. He recently wrote to me, after my couple of years in Europe, the interest in Proust in his major critics and commentators, of whom Professor Shattuck remains a major American figure, continues to be so vital and seems, in fact, to grow. When this conference is put together with the wonderful quality of this year's prize winners, there is increasing hope for infecting the youth. The young. <laughs> which I think is perfect. I wish to thank the nominating committee for the Shattuck Prize this year, which consisted of Jennifer Lyons, Jed Pearl, William Carter, Eleanor Cook, and former Shattuck Prize winner Marcella Valdez. Over the spring and summer, they carefully reviewed work samples and bios of many qualified nominees and selected our two superb prize winners. We sincerely thank them for their good work on this task. Before I present the, the prizes, I wanted to say a few words about Roger. I'm a fish out of water here with respect to literary criticism and credentials and certainly regarding Proust. So my perspective is of a personal nature. Over the years, my father shared with us some of his deeply held convictions about literature. I find three of these stated slightly differently in candor and perversion, and it is useful to be reminded of them. Works that have survived for centuries cannot be dismissed out of hand as stiflingly traditional and as part of the status quo needing above all to be usurped by the modern. Everything, that, everything has been said, nobody listens, Therefore, it has to be said all over again, <laughs> only better. In order to say it better, we have to know how it was said before. Reliance on methodology tends to eliminate the experience and the love of literature. I'm sure I don't need to elaborate on this, but my father was a bit of a rebel. To quote a friend and former student, Michael Prince, Roger exemplified a truly independent spirit with a quiet, stubborn, and courageous readiness to go his own way. In academic circles and in journalism, he courted unfashionable ideas, wrote about them beautifully, and made them appealing to an audience enviably wide. In personal life, you could always count on him to look you squarely in the eye and tell you what he thought. In terms of Roger's thoughts on Proust, I won't wade into that pool. However, I find an interesting and simple passage in Proust's way about learning from literature and Proust. To read genuine literature is to accumulate within oneself a fund of possible experiences against which to achieve an occasionally intensified sense of what one is doing, to recognize that one is alive in a particular way. I remember the verb to Proustify that I traded <laughs> classmates in college when we first explored Proust's novel. The word referred to a certain kind of urgent, involuntary recollection that we all experienced from time to time, and that now took on critical significance because we had read Proust and accepted this experience as something no longer trivial. We were constantly on the alert with our inner spectroscopes. Literature then like all the arts, plays a formative and preparatory role in training our sensibilities. As Proust's optical figures insist, true literature does not divert but directs. The great books affect the economy of life for many individuals by allowing them to achieve personal experience sooner, more directly, and with less groping. 
This passage seems to tie into Roger's 12th thesis, we teach what we hope to learn. So it seems appropriate that to celebrate the birthday of the first volume of Proust's oceanic novel, we turn to my father who read and then taught. We honor with the prizes in his name two emerging critics who exemplify the idea that critics, by helping us penetrate and savor such books, are themselves teachers. So first, I'd like to present the prize to Robin Creswell. Thank you, Patricia, for that very kind introduction. Um, it's a great, really great honor to receive this prize in the wake of um, a number of critics whom I admire, um, among them Marcella. I don't know if she's around. Um, and I'm deeply grateful to the Shattuck family as well as the Center for Fiction. So thank you. A few years ago, I was talking with uh, Lauren Stein at the Paris Review about some difficulties I had run into while writing my dissertation, which is about a group of avant-garde poets of the 1950s and 1960s in Beirut, when that city was known as the Paris of the Middle East. <clears throat> and the difficulties had to do with putting together my close readings of the poetry with uh, the political and social history of the region at that very turbulent uh, time. Lauren got up, took a book from the shelves, it was Roger Shattuck's The Banquet Years, and suggested that I might find it edifying. I told him that I had, of course, already read that, <laughs> which was a lie. <laughs> but shame is often my motive for reading good books, and I made sure that the next time I saw Lauren, I had read it, and could even make passing reference to provincial cosmopolitanism, which is one of the many remarkable ideas in that remarkable work of criticism. Here's where I should thank Lauren, um, not only for his always helpful suggestions for further reading, but also for his patience over many years as an editor of my work. Um, I feel extremely lucky to have had his counsel for as long as I have, even when it was never his job to provide it, and I know that I am a better writer because of him. Uh, when Noreen wrote me to say that I had been awarded this prize, I went back to the banquet years, which for those of you who haven't read it, but really you should, <laughs> is a group portrait of the Parisian avant-garde during the Belle Epoque, an era Shattuck describes as, quote, the long entertainment the city staged for itself in its own streets at a time when the structure of society was gradually capsizing. And this was another phrase that seemed to me an uncannily precise description of the Beiruti avant-garde in the golden age of that city preceding the Lebanese Civil War. In rereading The Banquet Years, which is Shattuck's, I believe, his first book published in 1958, I was amazed again by how deftly he blends the social, the biographical, and the literary in illuminating the works of his chosen artists, Rousseau, Jarry, Satie, and Apollinaire. Of course, to situate your reading at the crossroads of art history, social history, and everyday life is what we now call cultural criticism, and everyone does it, or at least tries to do it. But Shattuck was, I think, one of the first, and certainly among the very best. Much of the criticism that I've written over the past 10 or 15 years, uh, has to do with Arabic poetry and fiction, which is not a literature that is widely reviewed nor indeed widely read here, though there is, I think, increasing interest in it. And one of the challenges of writing about these books for an American audience is that knowledge of the context, um, the historical and intellectual context rather than the context provided by headlines, can't be assumed. Uh, and yet, Arabic literature is much more intimately connected with its political climate or microclimate than most literature written here. Poetry used to be called the CNN of the Middle East. 
in the days before Al Jazeera. Uh, and at times, there doesn't seem to be much distance between the poetical and the political. I don't mean that the works are propagandistic, only that the pressure of events and ideologies weighs on them palpably, and not to feel that pressure is to miss much of what makes them exciting and even pleasurable to read. Um, of course, this pleasure is not that of an escape from life into art, but a regrounding of art in the particulars of history, including the history of ideas and sensibilities. So the criticism I write often tacks between text and context, art and social life, in a way that I hope approaches the elegance of Shattuck's example. Since I know today is dedicated to Proust, I thought I should say something very briefly about my own experience with that novel, which is also at times a work of art criticism. In the summer I graduated high school, I went through a hellish period of jealousy. My girlfriend had left me for my best friend, and my response was to cut myself off from everyone I knew. I took long walks along the East River and imagined the worst. <laughs> then a teacher of mine who knew me better than I knew myself told me to read Swan's Way, <laughs> which I did. In fact, I read Proust's entire novel during that summer, and in the portrait of Swan in Love, I recognized myself as what jealous lover has not, and I underlined the famous passage in which Swan, suspecting Odette of infidelity, taps on the lit window he thinks belongs to her, but is in fact the home of a stranger. Here's the passage. He made what apology he could and hurried home, glad that the satisfaction of his curiosity had preserved their love intact, and that having feigned for so long a sort of indifference towards Odette, he had not now, by his jealousy, given her the proof that he loved her too much, which, between a pair of lovers, forever dispenses the recipient from the obligation to love enough. Another phrase I underlined, indicating I guess that it had struck home, is from the passage in which the narrator resolves to abandon Gilbert for good, for as he says, there can be no peace of mind in love, since what one has obtained is never anything but a new starting point for further desires. I'm not sure these are lessons any 18-year-old can or should have much use for, but reading the novel did cure me, in a way, of my jealousy. It did so by letting me see myself from the outside, like the pair of lenses that, as Proust says, quote, the author offers the reader in order to allow himself, in order to allow him to discern things which, without the book, he would possibly not have seen himself. I think what Proust's book allowed that me see was that my predicament wasn't so special as I imagined, and that my, lock, my walks along the East River, full of sighs and revenge plots, were basically comic, though I could only recognize this once I had broken the spell of self-absorption. Once that spell was broken, I could rejoin life, talk to my parents at dinner, play basketball with my friends. The irony here is probably familiar to anyone who has spent much time with Proust's novel, for although it has the reputation of being an analysis of the most refined forms of snobbery written by an aesthete who cut himself off from life to dedicate himself to art, I think most readers have found that reading the novel in fact brings us back to ourselves and readjusts our everyday perceptions as though we had been looking at the world for too long through an inferior prescription. Here, of course, I am only reaffirming Shattuck's own reading of Proust, what he called a corrective reading. In the introduction to Proust's way, he writes, quote, the protagonist of the search does not retreat to a monastery devoted to the religion of art. He returns to society in a last attempt to test the integrity of his literary calling. In this sense, Proust is much more like a social critic than a hierophant of literature. And like all good criticism, including the sort that Shattuck wrote, his work does not abandon us to dumbstruck contemplation, but returns us to the great banquet all around us, of which literature is merely one of the most nourishing courses. Thank you very much.
you so much, Patricia, Noreen, and everyone else. Um, it's a huge honor to be here. Um, I spent some time last week wandering down Swan's Way, as I imagine a number of you did, and I was delighted to learn a surprising tidbit about the history of the book. The beginning of the novel was originally supposed to serve as a response to a literary critic. Aha, I said, in a sense, Swan's Way originated as criticism. Usually we think of things the other way around. Criticism springs out of art rather than art out of criticism. And criticism is never at risk of turning into art, as Proust's pages certainly did. Yet I've always believed that criticism is an inherently artistic pursuit, one akin to the act of writing a poem or a story or a personal essay. That's one reason I got drawn into this game in the first place, and it's a big reason that I'm still at it. But this perspective is hardly universal. At many a social gathering, friends have posed the unanswerable question, but do you ever plan to write anything of your own? <laughs> As though, if you write about someone else's writing, you can't possibly be original yourself. But of course you can. Before I started writing reviews, I read with awe the work of Brian Boyd, Dan Chasen, David Orr, many other critics whom I still admire. I noticed how beautiful writing, once put in the hands of the right critic, could inspire equally beautiful writing, sort of like the way beautiful couples tend to have beautiful children. <laughs> Better yet, the original work doesn't even have to be so beautiful to inspire an accomplished review. As Oscar, <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> as Oscar Wilde notes in The Critic as Artist, from subjects of little or of no importance, if it be the critic's pleasure to waste his faculty of contemplation, he can produce work that will be flawless in beauty and instinct. Now, admittedly, it's not so easy to spin critical gold out of literary hay, but Wilde remains an inspiring standard. The power of criticism started to dawn on me thanks to a very artful critic indeed, my high school English teacher, a certain Dr. Shapiro. One day, Dr. Shapiro analyzed a Hamlet speech that includes the phrase, disasters in the sun. Disaster, he explained, has its root in the Latin word astrum, or star, and so the word coming so close to sun was a covert pun. In my memory, though I'm not really sure this is true, but in my memory, he is holding his tattered copy of Hamlet up to the ceiling, as though pointing toward the sun, and as though embodying what he had just done, which was take things up a notch, elevate Shakespeare by means of his own understanding. I got incredibly excited. Now, <laughs> those of you who know me know how I feel about puns, but this was more than the usual. I hadn't known until then that literature could do something so neat, or almost as importantly, that we could do something so neat with literature. The pun seemed something my teacher had at once noticed and created, an instance of the author's artistry and the critics, a Shakespeare Shapiro co-production. The incident was important for another reason as well. It was my first hint that criticism requires a very specific sort of faith. Reviewing a book, you may not immediately notice, say, the puns lurking behind the lines. But you need to keep looking anyway, and keep asking yourself, well, what if this were a pun? What would happen then? You need to imagine alongside the author you're reviewing. And then, if you're lucky, another narrative running next to that of the book itself will emerge. And that's the critic's creation. There's a nearly religious impulse to the act of criticism, a willingness to believe that anything could have meaning, anything could contribute to your overall understanding. Of course, you could be wrong, and often you are. But, as in religion, unless you have a little faith to begin with, you'll never find out. <laughs> And often enough, our critical prayers are answered. Once, for instance, several years ago, I was reviewing a lovely book of poems by H.L. Hicks for Poetry Magazine. When I had nearly finished the review, I started to feel a little unsettled. So much about the book had felt carefully plotted, 
but I hadn't noticed anything remarkable, uh, remarkable about Hicks's use of form. Like a disappointed believer, I appealed once more to God, or in this case, Hicks, and flipped through the book again, counting lines, counting feet, engaging in all the obsessive tics familiar to poetry readers of the formal persuasion. And then I realized something quite sneaky was going on. Almost every line was 11 syllables long, a subtle choice that perfectly complemented the book's theme. Thank God I had kept up faith, or I might never have noticed. Twice in the first chapter of his book, Proust's Way, A Field Guide to Lost Time, Roger Shattuck uses the term true believers. Members of this creed, he explains, insist that one read all of In Search of Lost Time rather than just parts, since there is no substitute for the cumulative effect of the whole work. In this creed, Shattuck surely included himself, and his creed extended elsewhere as well, to the, to the value of reading closely as well as widely, of writing eruditely as well as artfully. And Shattuck, the artist, pushed formal boundaries, as in his still relevant 19 theses on literature. And he was endlessly attentive to the shape of his sentences and the music of his phrases, just as he was to those of Proust, whom he elucidated like no other. I'd like to close with a quote from Shattuck's final thesis. I'd like to imagine him nailing these theses on the door of a university English department somewhere. He says that in the literature we love and teach lies our path through knowledge, a path we have to choose over and over again, like love in marriage. Our love of literature does not remain the same, yet its constancy sustains us. Thank you very much.